Hello, I'm John Osterhout, and in this video, I'm going to introduce the Paxos Consensus Protocol. Paxos was invented by Leslie Lamport in the late 1980s, and since then, it has become almost synonymous with the idea of consensus. When universities teach consensus in classes, they virtually always use Paxos as the algorithm, and most practical implementations of consensus are based in some way on Paxos. Paxos has become perhaps the single most important algorithm in all of distributed systems. I'm going to explain Paxos in the context of creating a replicated log, and then we'll use the replicated log to create a replicated state machine. When I say state machine, I just mean a program or application that takes inputs and produces outputs and holds some internal state. So you can think of almost any program or application as a state machine. The idea is that we'd like to make a state machine highly reliable, and the way we'd like to do that is by having the same state machine run concurrently on several different servers. And if each of those state machines receives the same set of commands in the same order, then they should all behave identically and produce the same results. So ideally, if some of the machines crash, the others can continue to provide service. Now, it's the goal of the replicated log to make sure that those state machines process commands in the same order. We first store the commands in a log and guarantee that all of the logs have the same commands in the same order. And then we process the commands out of the log and that guarantees the state machines all do the same thing. So here's how the system works. If a client wants to execute a command in the state machine, it first passes that command to one of the servers. Let's suppose the command is x. That server records the command in its own local log and then passes the command to other servers and each of them records the command in its log. Once the command has been safely replicated in all of the logs, then it can be passed to the state machines for execution. We sometimes use the phrase apply to refer to what happens when you actually execute the command. Once one of those state machines has executed the command, then its result can be returned to the client. And you can see that as long as the logs are identical on all of the machines and the state machines process commands out of the logs in order, then they're going to behave identically. It's the job of the consensus module to make sure that the log is properly replicated. And that's, that's what we'll use Paxos for. Now, the most important key property of a consensus-based approach is that the system can provide all of its services as long as a bare majority of the servers are up. So if we have a cluster with, say, five servers in it, then it can provide all of its services as long as three servers are up. So it can tolerate two of the five servers being down. And typically, the cluster sizes will be a small, odd number, such as three, five, or seven. Let me mention briefly the failure model that we'll assume for Paxos. This is a fail-stop model, which means that servers may crash, or they may stop and restart. But when they're running, they always behave correctly. They do not behave in malicious fashion, so-called Byzantine failures. We also assume that any messages on the network can be lost or they can be delayed, which means they can potentially arrive in different orders from what they were sent. Or the network could partition for a while with communication chopped off and then eventually the partition could be repaired to allow communication again. But again, we assume that when messages get through, they get through safely, they're not corrupted. And when servers are operating, they're operating correctly. There are several ways to decompose the problem of implementing a replicated log. The approach that Paxos uses is to first start with the simplest imaginable consensus problem. This is called basic Paxos or single degree Paxos. In this problem, there's a collection of servers and some of them may propose particular values. The goal of basic Paxos is to pick exactly one of those values. And if that value is picked, it's called chosen. That's all the system does. It picks a single value one time only. It doesn't pick a second value, doesn't change its mind, one value. So that's the simplest possible consensus algorithm you can imagine. And when people use the phrase consensus algorithm, they're typically talking about this very, very simple form. And also, if you hear the name Paxos in isolation, it's probably talking about this version of Paxos. Once we have this very simple form, choose one value, then 
we can create a log by putting together several instances of this, one instance for each of the entries in the log, and that's called multi-Paxos. In this video, I'll first explain basic Paxos and then show how we can build multi-Paxos out of it. Before going into the details of basic Paxos, let me first talk about the requirements. There are two overall requirements for the algorithm, safety and liveness. Safety means, in general terms, that the algorithm must never do anything bad. And so for basic Paxos, that means we must choose at most one value. We must never choose a second value to replace the first one. And the second safety requirement is that if a server believes that a value has been chosen, then it really truly has been chosen by the, by the cluster of servers. So these are the safety properties. Liveness properties say that we want the system eventually to do something good. It's not enough simply for it to do nothing bad. It must also do something good. And there are two liveness properties for basic Paxos. The first one is eventually we have to choose a value. We can't have analysis paralysis. And second, eventually the servers find out about the value that's chosen. Now these liveness properties have to hold under the general consensus notion. That is, as long as a majority of the servers are running and as long as they can communicate with each other uh, you know, reasonably quickly, then under these conditions, the cluster should be live. That is, it will eventually choose a value and everybody will find out about it. There are two components that work together to implement basic Paxos, proposers and acceptors. Proposers are the active elements. That is, they're actually trying to do something. They will typically receive requests from clients asking that particular values be chosen, and then they will try and put those values forth and get everybody in the cluster to agree to them. Acceptors, these are passive elements. They simply respond to requests that come from proposers. And their response, we can, you can think of their responses as votes, where a proposer is trying to get a majority of votes from the acceptors in the cluster. The acceptors store various pieces of state about the decision process, such as values that may, be cho may or may not be chosen and votes they've given out and so on. And eventually, acceptors also want to know which value was chosen. As we'll see, initially only the proposers know when a value has been chosen, but eventually want the acceptors to find out, for example, so they can pass that value to the state machine for execution. Now, in the traditional Lamport formulation of the problem, there's also a third element called listeners. These are the elements that want to know what's chosen. Uh, for this talk, we're simply lumping the listeners in with the acceptors. Furthermore, in this presentation, I'm going to assume that each server contains a proposer and an acceptor. It's possible to design Paxos where these elements are completely independent. But for this presentation, let's assume every server has one proposer and one acceptor. Over the next few slides, I'm going to go through a few examples to illustrate the kinds of problems we have to solve in order to achieve consensus. So for example, here's a very simple approach that unfortunately doesn't work. Suppose we just picked one acceptor and let that acceptor do all of the choosing of values. So in this world then, each proposer would send its value to the acceptor. The acceptor would pick one of them and then emit that value as the chosen value. Well, this is very simple, but unfortunately it doesn't handle the case where the acceptor crashes. If the acceptor crashes right after choosing, we have no way of knowing which value was chosen, and so we'd have to wait for that acceptor to restart. And remember, one of the goals of the algorithm is that the system has to be fully functional as long as a majority of the nodes are up. So this approach won't work. And in order to handle the failure of nodes, we're going to have to use some sort of a quorum approach, where we have a collection of acceptors, typically an odd number, like three or five or seven. And then a value will be considered chosen if it's been accepted by a majority of the acceptors. That way, if any one acceptor crashes, first of all, there's still a majority left that can accept the value. And if an acceptor crashes after accepting, there are other acceptors around that can indicate that the value was chosen. So this, this quorum notion will allow us to keep operating even if servers have crashed. However, making the quorum approach work is a little bit tricky. So for example, suppose we decide that each acceptor accepts only the first value it receives, that's it, and then whichever gets a majority wins. Well, you can see that there are situations where nobody might get a majority. You know, server one might get 
servers one and two to agree to which value, and server three might get three and four, and server five might get, get itself to agree. And so in this five node cluster, uh, we don't have any one value that has been agreed to by three of the five servers. This means that acceptors will sometimes have to change their mind. After accepting one value, an acceptor will occasionally have to accept a different value. Another way of saying this is that there's no way to guarantee that you can achieve agreement in a cluster in a single round. It may take multiple rounds in order to get to an agreement. Uh, one other thing I want to point out about this slide is that accepted does not mean chosen. A value is only chosen if it has been accepted by a majority of the nodes in the cluster. Now let's try a different approach where acceptors are more promiscuous. They'll accept every value they received. Unfortunately, this has two problems, which I'll show you on this slide and the next slide. The first problem is that we could end up choosing multiple values. For example, server one might propose the value red, ask other servers to accept it, and so servers one, two, and three accept that value red. Now that value is chosen since it's been accepted by a majority of the nodes in the cluster. But then server five might come along, propose a different value, blue, and ask acceptors to accept that value. And since they accept every value they receive, server three will now accept blue, even though it previously accepted red. And so now we've also chosen the value blue. And this violates the fundamental safety property that we have to choose only one value. The solution to this problem is that if a second proposer comes along, server five, once a value has already been chosen, it has to abandon any value of its own, and it has to propose the existing chosen value. So in this scheme, this means before server five can ask for acceptance of its value, it first has to look around and see if there are any other values out there. And if some other value has been chosen, then server five has to abandon its own value and instead use the value red. And then we'll end up with red chosen and so on. And we'll end up with a, a second chosen value, but it's the same as the first value. It's the same value. So what this means is we have to use a two-phase protocol. Unfortunately, the two-phase mechanism is not enough by itself. And this slide shows the example. Suppose server one comes along and it's going to propose the value red. It first checks with the other servers and sees that no other value has been accepted anywhere. So it starts asking servers to accept its value red. But meantime, before any of those uh, acceptors actually respond, another server comes along and asks, decides it's going to propose the value blue. And similarly, it looks and sees there are no other values chosen out there. And so it starts sending messages to get the blue value chosen. And in this particular scheme, it happens to finish first. It gets servers three, four, and five to accept that blue value. And so blue is now chosen. But meantime, the red server continues to work. And eventually, since the acceptors will accept multiple values, you can see it eventually gets a quorum here. And the red value ends up being chosen also. So again, once again, we have violated our fundal, fundamental safety property. The solution to this problem is that once we've chosen one value, any competing proposals have to somehow be aborted. That is, in this case, we somehow need for server three to actually reject that red acceptance request after it's already accepted blue. And the way we'll do this is that we're going to place an order on the proposals where newer proposals take precedence over old proposals. So once the blue proposal, which is later, has gotten out there, it will cut off the red proposal so that proposal cannot finish choosing a competing value. So to summarize, we're going to need a two-phase protocol where we somehow first check before we propose values. And then we'll also need to somehow order proposals so we can eliminate older proposals. Let's start by figuring out a way to order the proposals. The way we do this is by assigning each proposal a unique proposal number. That is, there has to be a number that has never been used for any previous proposal before. And we're going to decide that higher numbers get priority over lower ones. So when a server starts executing the, the protocol, its proposer must be able to choose a new proposal number 
that's unique and higher anything than anything it's ever seen or used before. And one way to do that is to concatenate two values. First, start with the server ID, give every server a unique identifier, and put that in the low order bits of the proposal number. So that guarantees that now no other server will ever generate this proposal or could have generated it before. And then in the higher order bits of the proposal number, we put a round number that's going to increment over time and be shared among all of the different servers. This is going to be used to try and generate a proposal number that's more recent than any number anyone else has ever generated. To do this, each server keeps track of all the round numbers that it has seen in incoming messages or used for its own proposals. And it stores the largest of these values in a variable called max round. So to generate a new number, it simply increments that value and then concatenates it with its server ID. In order for this to work, the proposers must make sure they save the latest value of max round that they've used on disk or some other stable medium so that it can be recovered after a crash. This is needed to make sure that we don't accidentally reuse a proposal number if we crash and then restart. This slide summarizes the mechanism for basic Paxos, and then the next slide goes into details. As I mentioned earlier, we have to use a two-phase approach. In the first phase, when a proposer is trying to get a value chosen, it's first going to send out to all of the other servers an RPC, a remote procedure call, that we call prepare. And this is going to serve two purposes, as you'll see in the slides coming up. First, it will tell us about any other values that might have been chosen, so we can make sure that we use that value instead of our own. And second, if there are other proposals out there that have not yet chosen their values, it will block them so they can't compete with us. So these are two very important things, remember, coming from the two problems that I showed you on the, the preceding slides. So the prepare gets us to a point where it's now safe to ask people to accept our value. The second phase, we're going to send out another remote procedure call called accept with a specific value for them to choose. And if a majority of them agree with us during this phase, then we can consider the value to be chosen. This slide shows the full protocol for basic Paxos. Let's walk through the life cycle of a request. As I've mentioned earlier, this is all driven by the proposers. So a proposer will start off with some value that it would like to have chosen. And it's going to go through two rounds of broadcasting messages, the prepare phase and the accept phase. But first, it must choose a proposal number. And for this, it used the mechanism that I described a couple of slides ago that provides it with a new unique number that it's never used before. Then it goes into the prepare phase. In this phase, it sends out prepare remote procedure calls to all of the acceptors in the cluster. And each of these messages contains that proposal number. Now, when an acceptor receives one of these prepare requests, it does two things. First, it must promise that it will never ever accept a proposal with a number less than the one in the incoming request. And in order to do that, it keeps around internally a variable that I will call min proposal. This is the lowest proposal number that this acceptor will ever request. And over time, this variable increases monotonically in value. So if we haven't already made a promise to somebody else not to accept proposals of this size, so if this is the highest proposal we've seen so far, then we update min proposal to keep track of that. So that's the first step. Then the second thing that the acceptor must do as part of their prepare request is to return information about any previous proposals it might have accepted. So if it has accepted a proposal previously, it remembers that around. It remembers both the value that accepted it and the number of the proposal. And it will return back the information about the highest proposal that it has accepted so far, if any. The proposer waits until it has received responses from a majority of the acceptors. And once it has received those responses, then it checks to see if any of them returned an accepted proposal. If so, then it picks the highest proposal number from all of those responses from acceptors and then uses the accepted value from that response to replace 
any initial value it might have started with, and it will use that as its value going forward. If no acceptor returned information about a previously accepted proposal, then the proposer can move forward with its own internal value. That completes the first phase. Then we move into the second phase, where the proposer now sends out an accept remote procedure call to every acceptor in the cluster. And the accept RPC contains two values. First, it contains a proposal number, and this must be the same as the proposal number from the prepare message. And in addition, it includes the value, either the initial value the proposer started with or an accepted value that it received back from an acceptor. So these messages are sent to all of the acceptors in the cluster. And then the acceptors handle those messages by comparing that incoming proposal number with the saved value min proposal. And if that proposal number is not as high as our min proposal, then this request gets rejected. But if it is high enough, then we accept the proposal by remembering the number of this proposal and the value of this proposal. And we also make sure that our min proposal is now at least as high as that proposal number. Whether we accept or reject the request, in the end, the acceptor returns the current value of its min proposal. And the, prepare, the uh, proposer can use that return value to see whether or not the, message was, uh, the request was accepted. The proposer waits until it has received responses from a majority of the acceptors in the cluster. And once it has those responses, then it checks to see if any of those requests were rejected. And it can tell if they were rejected by comparing the return value with the proposal number that it sent to the acceptor. If the request was rejected, then this proposer has to go back and start again. Fortunately, though, it can use the information in the result that proposal number to update its own information about proposals so that the next time around it can choose a high enough proposal number that it has a better chance of winning. But in the best case, the proposer will get back responses from a majority of the acceptors and they will all have accepted its request. And then at that point, this value is chosen and we're done. In order for this proposal to work, the acceptor has to guarantee the stability of these three values, min proposal, accepted proposal, and accepted value. So they have to be stored on disk, flash memory, or some other kind of device that can survive crashes and restarts of the acceptor's machine. Now I'm going to go through some examples to illustrate how Paxos works, particularly in the case when there are competing proposals. In order to understand why Paxos is correct, the key time to focus on is the prepare phase for the second proposal. Now we know if there's two proposals out there, they have unique proposal numbers. And so take the one with the later proposal number and focus on when that proposal prepares. And there are three possible situations. The first one is that the earlier proposal has already completed the whole process and chosen a value before the later proposal comes along. And that's the case in this slide. Before we walk through that, let me first explain the notation, since it's a little different than what I've used previously. So we're assuming there are two proposals out there with different values. For example, perhaps one client has asked server one to get the value X chosen, and another client has asked server five to get the value Y chosen. Now these boxes refer to the processing of particular requests on particular servers. So this box down here, means that server three received a prepare request with proposal number 3.1. And we know that proposal numbers consist of high order bits that are a round number and low order bits that are a server number. So we can see this proposal came from server one. So what we can see here is that server one has sent out prepare requests to servers one, two, and three, and they were all processed on those servers. Similarly, the notation over here means that server four received an accept request with proposal number 4.5, so that means it came from server five, and value x, and it processed that at that particular point in time. All right, so in this example, again, before the second proposer comes along, the first proposer has already gotten a value chosen, so that means the value has been accepted on a majority of the servers in the cluster. That is, the accept requests were successfully processed. 
So we're guaranteed, since the prepare requests for the second proposal have to also go to a majority of the machines, we're guaranteed there's some overlap. At least one of those prepare requests is going to go to a machine that processed an accept for the earlier proposal. And sure enough, that happens on server three. And so server five will see that accepted value X when it gets back a response to its prepare on server three. And so it will abandon the Y value and use the X value in all of its accept requests. So in this case, server five will succeed in getting a value chosen, but you can see it's the same value X that was chosen by server one. The second and third cases are in the situation where there has not yet been a previous value chosen at the time that the second proposal comes along to do its prepare phase. One possibility is that the earlier proposal has begun to get its value accepted, and the second proposal happens to see one of those accepted values. As you can see in this slide, server three has already accepted the value from the first proposal. And the second proposer happens to notice that value because its prepare comes after the accept. So in this case, the second proposal will use that existing value. Again, it will abandon the Y value and it will finish the process using the X value that it got from that server. So this ends up with the same outcome as the previous slides in that both of the proposers succeed and they both end up choosing the same value X. Now, when the second proposer gets this value back from server three, it has no way of knowing whether that value has actually been chosen or not, because it's only talked to a majority of the servers. It hasn't talked to all of them. And so it's possible that the accepts had completed on servers one and two, and server five just doesn't know about that. So if a server sees any accepted values returned by prepare requests, it has to assume they might possibly have been chosen, and it must go with that value instead of its own value. The third case is where a previous value has not been chosen at the time that the second prepare comes along. And furthermore, the second prepare does not see any signs that that earlier value has been accepted anywhere. It might have been accepted someplace, say in server one, but on the servers that server five checks, no previous value has been accepted. So in this case, server five will use its own value, the Y value, and it will get that accepted and eventually decide that that value is chosen. Fortunately, the act of preparing by server five has effectively cut off server one because eventually in order to get its X value accepted, server one will have to talk to one of the servers that had received a prepare request from server five. In this case, server three is the overlapping server. And the prepare request for server five has a later proposal number, 4.5. So because of this, server three will reject the request to accept the value X. So this will force server one to abandon its attempt to get X accepted. It will go back and start again at the beginning. And when it starts again, it'll do a new round of proposals out over here someplace and it will discover one of the accepted values from server five, one of those Ys. And so in this case, the first server will end up choosing the same value that server five chose. So again, we're consistent. Both of them eventually succeed. They both end up choosing the same value. The key thing to realize here is that these competing proposers must overlap in at least one server. And so the order in which they contact that server will determine the outcome. And there's only two possibilities. If the second proposer gets there first, it effectively cuts off the first one. Or if the first proposer gets there first, then the second one will see it and use its value instead of its own value. And so either way, we're safe. At this point, I hope I've convinced you that basic Paxos is safe. That is, no matter how many competing proposers there are, exactly one value will get chosen. However, at this point, basic Paxos is not necessarily live. We can end up in a situation where a collection of proposers stymie each other and no value ever gets chosen. This slide shows an example of that. So suppose server one successfully competes a round of prepares, 
But before it can do its accept round, another server, server five in this case, does its round of prepares. Well, that cuts off the accept for the, the earlier server on server three. So it will not succeed in this accept phase. So you can imagine it might immediately turn around, pick a higher proposal number, and start again. And suppose it gets its next round of prepares out before server five gets its first round of accepts out. Now you can see the new proposal number from server one has cut off the possibility of server five getting its value accepted. So server five will fail, and then this whole process could repeat where server five prepares with a newer higher round and that cuts off the next server one accept. This, value, this process could continue indefinitely. So in order to be live, Paxos needs to be supplemented with something else in order to, to prevent situations like this. One fairly simple approach would be for a server to wait a while. If it gets a failure and has to go back and restart, just wait a while before restarting to give other proposers a chance to finish. And perhaps even randomize that delay so that you don't have a collection of servers all waiting the same amount of time before restarting. So that's a simple approach. We're going to see something different in multi-Paxos. We're going to use something called leader election to try and make sure that there's only one proposer working at a time. There's one other disadvantage of the basic Paxos protocol I've described so far, and that is that once a value has been chosen, only one server knows what that value was. That's the server whose proposer ran through the whole protocol. For example, the acceptors have no idea whether a value they store has actually been chosen or not. So if some other server wants to know what value was chosen, the only way it can do that is to run the protocol itself. Start off with a, a default value to use, run the protocol, see if that value is used. Otherwise, you'll find out the one that's actually chosen. And at the end, you know the answer. So this completes the description of the basic Paxos protocol. Now let's move on to the multi-Paxos protocol. Remember, the goal of multi-Paxos is to create a replicated log. One way to do that is to use a collection of basic Paxos instances one independent instance for each of the entries in the log. So to do this, we just add an extra argument to each of the prepare and accept requests that selects a particular log entry, and all of the servers keep separate state for every entry into the log. The bottom half of the slide shows the life cycle of a request in this world. It starts off with the client machine that has a particular command it would like the state machines to execute. It sends that command to the Paxos module on one of the servers. That module runs the Paxos protocol to arrange for that command to be chosen as the value of an entry in the log. And of course, in doing so, it communicates with the other servers to make sure they're all agreed on the value for that log entry. Once the value has been chosen, then it can get passed to the state machine. Oh, by the way, of course, we wait for all of the previous values to be chosen and applied by the state machine as well. But once that's happened, then the new command can be applied by the state machine, and then the result is returned back to the client. This is the basic mechanism, but I'm going to need to fill in several details in order to make all of this real. This slide summarizes the issues we need to deal with in order to make multi-Paxos practical. I'll go over them briefly here and then come back to each of these in detail in the next set of slides. The first issue is how do we figure out which logger ent entry to use when a client request arrives on the server? The second issue has to do with performance. It turns out that if we were to implement multi paxos using the simple mechanism I described in the previous slide, it would be quite slow. And so instead, we're going to introduce a leader in order to reduce conflicts between servers. And then I'll show you how we can eliminate almost all of the prepare requests in the system so that we can handle incoming client requests with a single round of RPCs. The next issue is full replication. How do we make sure that all of the servers eventually get every log entry? And furthermore, that every server knows that every log entry has been chosen. Now, the next issue is the client protocol. I'll talk about some additional details to allow clients to survive server crashes in multi-Paxos. And then the final issue, issue has to do with configuration changes. How can we add new servers to the cluster of servers implementing multi-Paxos or remove old servers from that cluster and do that in a way that's safe? 
Now, I should mention that basic Paxos has been very thoroughly described in the literature and analyzed. It's been proven correct. And it's very, very well understood in a very precise way. But that's not the case for multi-Paxos. It's only described in very general terms in the literature with many alternatives and none of them fleshed out very concretely. Uh, furthermore, the implementations of multi-Paxos are not described in enough detail to know exactly how they solved these problems. And in fact, there are several ways to solve each of the problems on this slide. So for this talk, what we've done is to flesh out the multi-Paxos protocol in a particular way that we think is relatively easy to explain. Now, we have not implemented that, we have not proven it correct, so there is some chance that there will be bugs in what you'll see on the next slides. But I hope it will at least give you an idea of how you might solve all of the problems to build a practical multi-Paxos implementation. The first problem is how to choose which log slot we should try when a request arrives from a client. And to illustrate how we do this, I'm going to use the example at the bottom of the slide here. Let's imagine we have a cluster with three servers, so a majority is two. And this shows the logs, the state of the logs in each of those servers. At the time when a client sends a jump request to server one, so the client would like this request to be recorded in the log and executed by the state machines. Now, when it arrives on server one, Server 1's log entries can be in a bunch of different states. Some of the entries the server will know have already been chosen, and I've illustrated those in this figure by using the bold outline around them. I'll talk more in later slides about how we know that entries have been chosen, but for example, if Server 1 was the one that, that actually arranged for those entries to be chosen, then of course it will have known that they were successfully chosen. So some of the entries in its log it knows to be chosen. There may be other log entries where the server has a value, it has accepted a value like CMP and slot 3, but it doesn't yet know whether that entry has been chosen. In this particular case, we can see it has been chosen since it's, that entry is also accepted on a different server, but server 1 has no way of knowing that. Then there may be other entries in the server's log where the entries are currently blank. It has not accepted a value for those, but of course it's possible that other servers in the cluster have accepted values for those entries. So let's walk through what happens. When the jump request arrives at server one, it finds the lowest index in its log that has an entry that is not yet known to be chosen. So that's going to be entry three in the server's log. And then it tries to arrange for the jump value to be chosen for that entry. And uh, just to make this example specific, let's assume that server three is offline can't actually access it. So all of the Paxos protocol runs with servers one and two. So server one will try to, to choose jump for slot three, but of course it will find this existing value in slot three. And so it will have to give up on jump and instead it will finish choosing the compare value. And we can see that happens over here if we look at the result of the whole operation. So in this, server one will arrange for compare to get accepted by server two. And it will choose that and now we see that entry is bold to mark it as chosen. When that happens, then we haven't satisfied the client's request yet, so we go back and start again. Find the first log entry not yet known to be chosen. That's going to be entry four this time. Try and choose jump for that entry. Well, this time, unfortunately, server one is going to see that server two has already accepted a value for that entry, and so it will drop jump again, and it will choose the sub value for that entry. And then, of course, it will go back again, Start again, this time it will use slot five. And now when it does slot five, it will be able to choose jump successfully because it will not discover any other accepted entry in that slot. And so we'll see the jump now gets placed in slot five and is chosen for that slot. The next time that the server receives another request, it will use the next unchosen slot, which will be slot seven the next time around. The bottom line is that when a server receives a request, it just starts at an unchosen slot and keeps working its way through higher and higher slots until eventually it finds a slot where it can choose the client's command. With this approach, a single server can handle several client requests at the same time. If a particular client request is using slot three, for example, then the next client request would try slot four or five or six to find a different slot. And as long as we're using different log entries for each request, they can all, all proceed totally independently and in parallel. However, when it comes to the state machine, then we have to do things 
sequentially and in order. That is, the commands must get passed to the state machine one after another in the order they appear in the log. So we can't process the fourth log entry in the state machine until the third one has been processed, and of course the second one has to be processed before that one. The next issue to address is efficiency. And there are two problems with the algorithm as I've described it so far. The first one is that if there are multiple proposers all working at the same time, we still risk having conflicts between them and some of them having to restart. You may remember I talked about live lock under basic Paxos. The same thing can happen here. And in fact, if we have a high load situation, the problem could be really extreme. If there are many clients all talking concurrently to multiple servers, all trying to choose values for the same log slots, we could get into a world where the system is thrashing like crazy and not making much progress. The second problem is that each individual log entry currently requires two rounds of remote procedure call. First, the proposer has to send a round of prepares, and then it has to send a round of accepts after that. So in order to make things more efficient, we're going to make two changes. First, we're going to arrange so that typically only a single server is acting as proposer. and We funnel all of the client requests through that one server. We'll call that server the leader. And then the second thing is that it turns out we can eliminate almost all of the prepare RPCs. And the way we're going to do this is we'll do one round of prepares at the beginning for a leader, but it will prepare for the whole log, not just a single entry. And then once it's done that prepare, it can create many log entries just by using the accept round. It will not have to use the prepare round anymore after that. And that will cut in half the number of RPCs that we have to issue. First, let's choose a leader. There are many different ways of electing a leader. This slide just describes a particularly simple one that was suggested by Leslie Lamport. The idea of this approach is that since servers already have IDs, let's see if we can just find the server with the highest ID and let that server act as leader. The way we do that is that every server sends a heartbeat message to every other server at a regular interval, say every t milliseconds. And those messages contain the ID of the sending server. Then, of course, at the same time, all of the servers are monitoring the heartbeats they have received from other servers. And if they haven't received a heartbeat from a server with a higher ID recently, and by recently I mean let's allow long enough that it's pretty likely we would have heard from that server if it existed. So if this server has not heard from any higher ranking servers, then it starts behaving as a leader. And what that means is first that it will accept requests from client machines, and second, in the Paxos protocol, it will act as proposer as well as acceptor. Now, if a machine has received a heartbeat from another server with a higher ID, then it won't act as leader. So this means that if it receives a client request, it rejects that request and tells the client to talk to the leader instead. The other thing is that these non-leader servers will not act as proposers. They will only act as acceptors in the protocol. The upshot of this mechanism is that it makes it pretty unlikely that we will ever have two leaders trying to work at the same time in the system. Now, of course, Paxos will work if there are two leaders at the same time. It's just that there are more likely to be conflicts, and so it won't work as efficiently. I should also mention that in practice, most practical systems would not use this approach for leader election. They would probably use a lease-based approach, which is a little bit more complicated, but has some other advantages that I don't have time to go over in this video. The second efficiency improvement is to cut down on the number of remote procedure call requests that need to be issued. And the way we do this is by getting rid of almost all of the prepares. To see how this works, let's first go back and review why we need prepares in the first place. And remember, there are two reasons. The first one is that we use the prepare request to tell acceptors about our new proposal number in order to block out any old proposals that might otherwise compete with us. And then second, we use the prepare to find out about any values that have already been accepted. And so we can use those instead of our own uh, preferred value. Now the first issue, blocking old proposals, we can deal with that by changing the meaning of a proposal number. Rather than keeping a separate proposal number for each log entry, make proposal numbers global so they refer to the entire log. If we do this, then once we've completed one round of prepares, we know we've blocked off the whole log. There's no need to do additional prepares for subsequent log entries. 
The second problem is a little trickier because there could be a whole bunch of accepted values out there for different log entries on different acceptors. In order to handle this, we extend a little bit the information that's returned by the prepare request. As before, a prepare still returns information about the highest proposal that the acceptor has accepted, and it does that only for the current entry we're asking about. But in addition, the acceptor looks in its subsequent log entries after the one for the current request, and if it has no accepted values for any log entries past the current one, then it returns a flag indicating that. Eventually, if we're using the leader election mechanism, the leader will get to a point where each acceptor returns no more accepted. We get to the point where we already know about all of the uh, entries that's accepted in, in this log. And so once we get to that point for an individual acceptor, then we don't need to send any more preparers to that acceptor. We already know the state of its log. Furthermore, once we get no more accepted return values from a majority of the acceptors in the cluster, then we don't need to set any prepare re remote procedure calls at all. So in this case, the leader can simply send accept messages. And so it only needs one round of remote procedure calls for each log entry. And it can continue in this mode indefinitely. The only thing that could change this is if somebody else decides to become leader. And when that happens, then one of the accepts of the current leader will be rejected. And then we'll have to go back and start all this, this whole process over again. So far, we've addressed two of the five issues that I mentioned for Multipaxos. The third issue is what I'm calling full disclosure. And the goal here is to get every acceptor completely up to date on all the information that's known about the log. Right now, the algorithm does not provide complete information. For example, log entries might not be fully replicated on all of the servers. They only need to be accepted on a majority of the servers for a particular entry to be chosen. Well, what we want to do is make sure that every log entry is replicated on every server. The second thing is that right now, only the proposer knows when a particular entry has been chosen. And the way it knows that is that it gets responses back to a majority of its accept RPCs. But none of the other servers know whether that entry is chosen. For example, the acceptors don't know that an entry they store is now chosen. So we also want to notify all the servers so they know about all the chosen entries. One reason for providing this full information is that this now will allow all of the other servers to pass commands to their state machines and execute them on their state machines so that their state machines keep up with the state machine on the leader. If we don't do this, if they don't have the log entries or they don't know which ones are chosen, then they can't apply those commands in their state machines. So I'll explain how to do this in four steps. The first step is that we don't stop with our accept RPCs once we've got, got a quorum. That is, if we've heard from a majority of the servers enough to choose that log entry, then we can go ahead and apply the command in our local state machine and return a response to the client. But in the background, keep retrying those RPCs on all of the other servers until eventually all of the acceptors have responded. And that can be done in background again, so it does not slow anything down in the system. So this will guarantee that any new entries that we create on this server will find their way to all of the other servers. So that will provide almost full replication. It doesn't quite get everything because there could be other earlier log entries that only got partially replicated before a server crashed that might not be fully replicated. So we'll still have to deal with those. All right, now the second part of the solution is that in each server, we need to keep track of which entries are known to be chosen. And there are two things we do for that. The first thing is that if a server finds out that an entry is chosen, then it sets the accepted proposal value for that log entry to this distinguished value that I'll just call infinity. Basically, it's a, a larger value than any other proposal that could ever exist. So that's just a mark that says this proposal is known to be chosen. And by the way, using an infinity value kind of makes sense in that you would never overwrite an accepted proposal unless you found another proposal with a higher number. And so by using infinity as a number, we know that this proposal will never get overwritten, which it should not, anyhow, since it's been chosen. So in addition to that, each server maintains a single value called first unchosen index. And this is just the smallest index of a log entry 
that has not yet been marked as chosen. So it's the lowest numbered log entry whose accepted proposal value is not infinity. The next step, part three of our four-part solution, is for the proposers to provide acceptors information about entries that it knows to be chosen. And it does this by piggybacking the information on accept requests. Every accept request sent from a proposer to an acceptor includes that first unchosen index of the proposer. In other words, the acceptor now knows that all of the entries numbered less than that are chosen on the proposer. And it can use that information to update its own knowledge about chosenness. And to, to illustrate that, let me go through an example. So suppose we have an acceptor's log as given down here. So I'm showing the log of an acceptor before it receives an accept request. And the information I'm showing in the log is only uh, the accepted proposal number in the entry. I'm not showing the value of the entry. So we can see that in this acceptor, entries one, two, three, and five have already been marked as chosen. Entries four and six, they have other accepted proposal numbers, so they have not yet been identified as chosen by this acceptor. And now suppose an accept request arrives as shown in the line there. And in particular, it arrives with proposal 3.4 and first unchosen index of seven. So again, this means that on the proposer, all log entries numbered up through six, but not including seven, have been chosen. The way the acceptor uses this information is that it compares this proposal number with the accepted proposal numbers in all of its log entries up to this first unchosen index. And if any of them have that same proposal number, it marks them as accepted. So in this case, log entry six has a matching proposal number. And so the acceptor marks that entry as chosen. Now to understand why we can do that, think about what the acceptor knows. So first of all, since the proposals match, the acceptor knows that this log entry came from the same proposer that's sending that accept message. We also know that the entry by this index, entry six, we know that entry is chosen in the proposer. And furthermore, we know the proposer could not have a more recent value than this in its log because the proposal number in this entry, the accepted proposal number, equals the current proposal for that proposer. So we know that this entry is in the range of those that are chosen on the proposer. And furthermore, we know it's the most recent value that could possibly be stored on that proposer. So it must be the chosen value. And as a result of that, then, the acceptor can mark its entry as, as uh, chosen. Of course, meantime, at, during the accept request, we also accept a new entry that appears in our log. That's this extra entry out here at index eight. And so, as you see it down here, that's the way the log will look on the acceptor after it has finished processing the accept message. Now, I should point out that this mechanism doesn't yet solve all problems. The problem is that the acceptor could have received some log entries from a different proposer. So entry four, for example, was received from, looks like server five in some previous round. And unfortunately, there's no way for the acceptor to know whether that entry is the chosen entry or not. It's possible that could be a stale value that has been replaced. It could be that the proposer, we know the proposer has an entry in slot four that has been chosen, but we don't know that it's the same entry as this. It could be a more recent value. So we're not quite there yet. We still have one more step to do. The final step is to deal with the problem of log entries that an acceptor received from old leaders. And so it's not sure whether they have been chosen or not. The way this is handled is that whenever an acceptor responds to an accept request, it returns its own first unchosen index in the response. And then the proposer, when it receives that response, can compare its first unchosen index with the index that it received in the response. And if its index is greater, then that means the acceptor is uncertain about something. And so what the proposer does is to send the exact contents of that entry that the acceptor is uncertain about. And the way it does that is with a new RPC called success. This is the third RPC used in multi-paxos, and it carries two parameters, the index of a log slot and a value for the log slot. This message is a notification that a particular value has been accepted at a particular log position. 
There's no more uncertainty about that. And so the recipient simply takes the information from the message and updates its log to reflect that. And then it returns its new first unchosen index. Since there may be several values that the acceptor was uncertain about, this allows the proposer to send another success RPC and another one after that until eventually the acceptor has caught up to the knowledge base of the proposer. This set of mechanisms, we're guaranteed that eventually all of the servers in the system will find out about all of the log entries that have been chosen, and will also find out about the fact that they have been chosen. And in the normal case, there's no overhead for getting all this information out. It's passed in the normal accept messages that are used to choose new log entries. So there's no extra cost for that. The extra overhead only happens when there's been a change of leaders. And it may happen for a short time after that until everybody's fully updated on all of the decisions that were made by the old leader. The fourth of the five issues for multi-Paxos is the mechanism for how clients interact with the system. If a client wants to issue a command to this replicated state machine, it sends that command to the current leader of the cluster. Now, if the client has just started up and doesn't know which of the servers is acting as leader, then it can send the command to any server in the cluster. And if that server is not the leader, it will return some information to the client that allows it to try again with the real leader. So eventually, it will find the leader. Once the leader gets the message, the leader uh, the leader arranges for the command to be chosen in a log entry, waits until that is complete, then it passes the command to its own state machine, and once the state machine has processed the command, then the leader will return a response back to the client. A client sticks with one leader until it stops being able to work with that leader. For example, the leader might crash, and in with that case, a request from the client to leader will time out. If that happens, the client just picks any other server in the cluster, just pick one at random, and try the command again with the other server. And the same mechanism will happen. Eventually, it will find a new leader. And then it retries that request with the new leader. And eventually, the request will succeed. However, this retry mechanism creates a problem. What if a leader has successfully executed a command and crashed at the last second before responding? Well, then the client is going to retry that command with a new leader, and it's possible that the same command could end up getting executed twice. And we can't allow this. We want to make sure that each command is executed exactly once. The way this works is that the client provides a unique identifier with each command, something that's totally unique to that client. You can imagine, again, it's a client identifier number plus a sequence number for a command. That entry is included in the information the client sends to the server, and the server logs that information in the log entry along with the command. Meantime, as the state machine is executing commands, it keeps track of the most recent command that it's executed for each client. It just keeps track of the highest ID number that it's seen for any, each individual client. And before it executes a new command, it checks to see if that command has already been executed. So in the case where the leader crashes and the client retries with the new leader, the state machine in that new leader will see that it already executed the command once. Its log got that command from the old leader before it crashed. And so it will see that this command has already been executed. And in that case, it does not execute the command the second time around. It simply returns the response that it generated during the first execution. The result of this is that as long as the client doesn't crash, we get exactly once semantics. Each client command is executed exactly once by the cluster. Now, if clients crash, then we end up with at most once semantics. That is, if a client crashes, its command may or may not have been executed. But if the client stays up, we know the command executes exactly once. The last of the five issues has to do with configuration changes. When I say system configuration, what I mean is information about the servers that are participating in the consensus protocol. So that's typically an ID for each server and its network address that you use to communicate with it. The thing that makes system configuration really important is that this determines what is the current quorum that's in effect. And if we change the number of servers, that can change. For example, if we increase the number of servers from three up to five, then the quorum changes from being two servers up to being three servers. And we need to be able to change the configuration for a couple of reasons. For example, if machines fail, 
we need to be able to swap a new machine in to replace it. Or perhaps we want to change the quorum size. Maybe we decide we need a more reliable cluster and so we switch from, say, five servers to seven servers in order to do that. Mission changes are tricky because they change the quorum. And the safety requirement is we need to somehow change the configuration so that there's never a point in time when there can be two different non-overlapping majorities that could end up choosing different values for the same log slot. For example, suppose we're changing from a configuration with three servers to one with five servers. That is, we're adding two more servers to the configuration. Suppose somehow we end up in a state where some of the servers believe the old configuration is in effect and some believe the new configuration is in effect. Then what could happen is that, for example, these two servers, those constitute a quorum in the old configuration, and so they could choose a particular value, say V1, and then suppose these other three servers they believe the new configuration is in effect. Well, three constitutes a majority of the new configuration. And so these servers could choose a different value for the same log slot. So clearly, we can't have that. We need to make sure that there's enough agreement on what the configuration is that only a single value is chosen for each log slot. The solution suggested by Leslie Lamport for handling configuration changes in Paxos uses the log to manage the changes. So the current configuration is stored as a log entry, and it gets replicated just like any other log entry. So in the example log here, two of the log entries describe configurations. The others are just ordinary commands for state machines. Now, the interesting twist to all of this is that any given entry, the configuration to use for choosing that entry, is determined by the configuration that was in effect at an earlier entry. And there's a system parameter called alpha that determines how much earlier. So suppose alpha is 3, for example, and we have these two configuration change entries here. The C1 configuration change is stored in log slot 1, and C2 is stored in log slot 3. So what that means is that C1 won't actually take effect until log slot 4, that is three entries later. And configuration 2, C2, won't take effect until three slots later for it, which is log entry 6. So that means that when we're choosing log entries 1, 2, and 3, we will use the preceding configuration, whatever it was that was in effect before C1. I'll call that C0. That will be used for that. Once we get to log entry 4, we now use the configuration that was in effect as of log entry 1, so that's C1. And that will continue to apply to entry 5. And then finally, when we get to entry 6, C2 will take over at that point and will apply for all of the remaining entries mentioned that this alpha is a system parameter, something you'd set when you start your system. And it has some interesting properties. In particular, this parameter limits the number of entries that we can be choosing simultaneously in the system. Clearly, we can't choose entry i plus alpha until entry i has been chosen, because we won't know which set of servers are in the configuration and what constitutes a majority for the prepare and accept requests. So if alpha is really small, say only one, for example, in the extreme, we'd be totally serialized. We couldn't start choosing entry two until after entry one had been chosen. If, I is, uh, alpha, if alpha is three, that means we can be choosing three entries simultaneously at any given point in time. If we make alpha really, really large, then that could be complicated because we may have to wait a while for a new configuration to take effect. For example, if alpha is 1,000, then we can't actually assume that a new configuration is in effect until 1,000 entries after the one containing that change. Now, if that's a problem and you want to force a configuration change to complete quickly, you can always just stuff the log with no ops, fill it up, get a whole bunch of commands committed into, uh, chosen into the log in order to get past that range of alpha entries so that you know the new configuration is in effect. To summarize configuration changes, it's a very simple mechanism again. We just store the configuration like any other log entry, 
and then we just have to wait a few log entries before we start using the new configuration. This concludes my description of the Paxos protocol. Let me just summarize what I've covered so far. First, I talked about basic Paxos. This is the simplest possible consensus you could imagine. Agree on a single value among a collection of servers. And remember, it has this very important two-phase approach where we use the prepare phase to find, about, find out about already chosen values and also to disable other proposals. And then we use the accept phase to actually complete the process. Then I described how you can take a collection of these basic Paxos instances and make them work together to choose a collection of entries in the log. And so I talked about how you decide which log entry to choose. Then I talked about a couple of changes to improve performance. So we don't quite use the basic Paxos protocol that you would use uh, if you're just doing a single value Paxos. Instead, we elect a leader to cut down on contention. And then we can eliminate most of the prepare requests by making a prepare actually prepare the entire log rather than a single entry. Then the final step of multi-Paxos is I talked about how we get everybody completely updated. So all of the replicas really do have identical information on them. I described a little bit how clients interact with the system. And the key idea here is how errors are handled. The most important thing to remember there is that by embedding a unique identifier from the client in each request, we can eliminate duplicate request processing and make sure that each command is only processed once by the state machines. And then finally, I described how Paxos handles configuration changes by recording the configuration in the log and then using this alpha mechanism where the log itself determines which configuration is used for each future entry stored into the log. Thanks for your attention, and I hope this has helped you to learn a little bit more about the Paxos protocol.